Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the pod against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. We are not there yet. This is science fiction. We have in front of us two main challenges to resolve before to arrive to this kind of uh, solutions. The first is thinking about how we are able to find the right mathematical functions to mimic the intelligent behavior. Now we are thinking the things based on errors and trials. We don't know what is the real way to sophisticate the way that we are executing that kind of artificial intelligence. But also we have a second challenge. The second challenge is rated that in the, during the last 20 years, owing the increase of the computational power, and the availability of the amount of data, a vast amount of data, machine learning algorithms had quite remarkable success in tasks from, in several tasks, from computer vision to play games. However, to reach the point when the current computational tools we are arriving to the point that the current computational tools are not longer be sufficient. Also, to tailoring, the, we, also we have tailoring architectures that could be the GPUs or could be the TPUs, the, the graphical processing uh, units or the tens, tensor processing units. They don't are standard enough to be able to escalate. So the conference today is about how we are working to move forward the future. I am Elisa Martin. I am the CTO for IBM Spain. I am a member of the Academy of Technology. A lot of my work is working with technology to introduce disruption with the technology, and thank you very much to join me, because even in how I am working in artificial intelligence, I knew the human world to feel better, and also to transmit, and to have a double direction of communication. Of course, that during the last year, during the last decades, we advanced a lot. We are in the middle of the journey. And of course, the majority of the people are for sure that during this conference you are seeing several tens and thousands of conferences that the people is, is really looking for the future. And the people is looking for the artificial intelligence like opportunity. Also, we are advancing a lot to understand that when we talk about artificial intelligence, we need to talk also about information architecture. Oh, very similar words, isn't it? Very similar capital letters in different positions. But you, can do, you cannot do something, you cannot do anything in artificial intelligence if you don't understand how you are going to manage the information. Even though you are not going to do anything if you are not able to understand what data is required in your artificial intelligence goals. Also, we know very well what are the steps to, to execute. 
We are able to collect data, organize data, analyze data, trust and transparency in the, in the things that we are doing, and also how to infuse all of this information to, automati to automa automate some process. Also, we understand that we need the data is in different places, and we have different types of data. So we need to think in also in a multi-data architecture. We cannot relate just in one shape of the information. And at the end, as companies as IBM and on other companies, we also realize that we need to use open technologies in this roadmap that we have in front. We need to use open technologies for the data science to build and train at the scale, but also we need to think about for machine learning and for the people that build the algorithms, how to be able to embed that algorithms in our process. How we are able to opera, opera, operationalize these algorithms, and also how we are able to deploy and manage and monitoring that kind of algorithms. But still, there are problems that we are not able to resolve with the current with the current approach. We have problems that you have in the bottom of this diagram. We have problems that is in the end complexity. That means that we are talking about linear problems. That kind of problems is like when we are in the top of a building, just to try to use a reference of the complexity. The second, the second level of complexity in the problems is when we are talking about the potential functions. Some problems that are, could be represented by potential function. That could be when you try to organize and you try to not organize, you try to find the primate, uh, the primate numbers, okay? The descomposition of the primate numbers. So, at the third level, of complexity is the problem that you can express them in an exponential, through exponential curves or exponential functions. This kind of, um, we need to advance in order to resolve the two, the two top lines. Because if in the first line we were in the, in the top of the building, when we are in the second line, we are in the level of the atmosphere, the planet atmosphere. But we like to go to the third level, the complexity of the problem, we are talking about problem in the level of the universe. To, res to respond to this kind of challenge, historically, we are moving through, you know, to resolve challenge itself. We are not moving in a, in a let me say, a, 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 systematic uh, advance of the things. We are moving, challenging people to do different kind of things. Starting from the beginning, the first demonstration to, to be able to train a machine learning uh, network in order to, to play in an automatic way a game, it was in the 1959, where this uh, colleague from IBM was able to was able to execute in an automatic in an autonomous way a play to the check checkers. Okay. From that point, through the big blue jeopardy and arriving to the AlphaGo game, all of this is helping us to advance in the artificial intelligence. But sometimes, things happen before. For instance, in this, in, this, uh, in this diagram, in this picture, you have Gerald Tesoro, that is also coming from IBM, and, and he, he is the father of the reinforcement learning working, and it's the first time that he was able to make it working automatically. He did it with a game that is the badminton, and he used also the pictures in order to training the neural network 
to make it happen. AlphaGo is a uh, sophisticated way to use the same kind of techniques several years after. But also, we are able now to do something else. As IBM, we have a new challenge in front. Jeopardy was in, the, in 2011. In 2012, as a company, we decided to have a new challenge, and that was to design a system to be able to debate. Debate is a, a more complex problem. It's not only answer questions. It's not only to understand the context. Debate is thinking about the ambiguities, how you are going to manage the ambiguities, and also how you are going to manage not only the understanding of the questions, but also how you are going to build the answers, the, sorry, how you are going to build the arguments, okay? Again, the different themes, the different themes of the different topics that you have in the debate. You need to understand, but also generate the information. I think the argument is going to be an, a clear and a very good uh, entertainment for all the people here in Spain debating, because we love argument. So I suppose that we like to have something like this in a, in, with us in a house. But taking, taking care of the media. Subsidizing space exploration is like investing in really good tires. It may not be fun to spend the extra money, but ultimately you know both you and everyone else on the road will be better off. So, you can see how the system generate the speech. The system is able to organize the information in order to support the first, the first argument about the topic. Afterwards, the system is able to listen the person that also put on the table the arguments. And with all of these uh, elements, the system was able to generate a new speech, giving the reasons why he is supporting that position in the, in the debate. And after that, he is able to, to create and generate again a summary of the different content for the argument. So we are talking about a different dimension about what are the capabilities of the systems. When we talk about the evolution of the artificial intelligence, and I suppose that everyone is very familiar with that, really, today, we are talking about neural networks, and inside of the ne neural networks, we are talking about deep learning. But the reason why we are, we are now in this explosion of the deep learning has a lot of relation with the capacity of the systems. If we take a look at what happened in 2012, why, if we, take a, a, if we see this, this graph where we have the accuracy of a neural network in order to uh, recognize an uh, image, you can see the real optimization happen when we introduce in the, in the execution of these neuro neuronal networks, we introduce the accelerators, the GPUs hardware. And the, after, the years after, we are able to arrive to the point that the optimization of the execution of the neuronal networks are close and better of the human. But still, we are in the narrow, what we call narrow art artificial intelligence. So, really, we are talking about systems that are able to execute single tasks in a single domain, that maybe we, they have an, a superhuman accuracy, a superhuman speed, but they still are not a very standardized every time you need to define a specific system, you need to design and execute, build and execute a specific system in this specific domain.
It's true that we advance a lot. We advance a lot in the language translation, for sure. We advance a lot in the trans transcription, in the language processing, in the face recognition, in the object detection. But this is simple task, simple element to be analyzed by a neural network. But also, we need to, afford, to, to affront another uh, challenge. And we are doing well also to do that. So this, the, the next challenge is about how we are able to resolve the, with a uh, neural network two different tasks. That means to recognize the image and at the same time to be able to write to the, the description about what the image is about. Okay? I think if you take a look of the different image and if you take a look of the description, it looks quite well, okay? So the, the description describes very well, quite well, the, the image itself. And if you go to the last one, maybe, you know, I don't know if a person is able to do a better description than this one, okay? So it looks quite well that we are able to do these kind of things in a very good way. So. Now, if, what, if we are buying in the artificial intelligence, we need to afford multi multitask. That means to be able to have this kind of algorithms, able to execute or able to manage different kind of parameters in a multi-domain, in a very distributed way and information, and with an a semi -autonomous, in a semi-autonomous way. And this is the the, the time that we are starting now. So the sample that you have, and you are seeing in the video, is exactly the best moment in the open, um, in the open mm, golf uh, uh, concourse. So, master, thank you. Thank you. This is the reason that I like to have people in front of me, <laughs> to help me. So in the master, this moment was selected by an artificial intelligence system. And was selected not because someone telling them, no, because you have a specific annotations on the videos, because this is in real time. The system select that because recognize different kinds of elements on the image. They recognize sentimental. When the people really, you know, love or loud and make a lot of noise when the things happen, okay? To recognize also the behavior of the different players and to recognize also the statistics, everything together. And with all of these parameters together, the neural network was able to define that this is the best moment for the master and this is the moment that they are going to reproduce in the TV news. So, if we like to, to move forward in the artificial intelligence and to move to this new step, we need to think about the following topics. We need to think about explainability. We need to think about not only to execute the models, to thinking about how we are able to explain what is the behavior of the models. We need to create a sense of trust in the models and the transparency about what we are executing. Also, we need to think about, about security. We need to avoid to, to have another networks, neural networks, attacking the behavior of our algorithm, okay, and introduce errors in the behavior of the algorithm. Also, we need to think about how we are able to train the system with a small data. Because for the different use cases, we are not plenty of data. Some cases maybe yes, but in another cases, and if we are moving in the, in the business, in the enterprise area, not all the all institutions has a vast amount of data for all the use cases to be able to train the systems. And the only way to resolve this is to, to be sure to, that you are going to be able to capture the knowledge that you have, to store your knowledge, and to use that knowledge as, uh, as analogous 
in order to be able to resolve the algorithms. But also we need to think about the ethics. If we need to trust in the artificial intelligence, we need to be sure that the algorithms has a correct behavior, has an ethic behavior. So everything that we are doing related with bias, that we are doing in order to identify if a data set has bias or it doesn't have bias, and how we are able to correct a data set in order to correct the behavior of the algorithms is something that we need to put in place. Jointly with, with the specific, or not specific, jointly with the platform that is another, uh, another uh, topic to move forward, platforms to manage the artificial intelligence life cycle, all of them together, we need to move forward in order to be able to manage the algorithms. Because previously, we learned a lot about how we are able to manage the applications. Now, we need to understand how we are going to manage the algorithms. But not from the point, only from the point of view of the, 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 how we are designing that, how we are executing that, how we are training that, but also how we're monitoring that, and, also, and how we are taking care of these concepts of the ethics. In order to do that, in IBM, we create one, one new services in IBM Cloud that is calling OpenScale. But also, we put in the, put in the open, open, open source uh, community, we put uh, Fair, Fairness uh, 360 in order to help the people with seven algo with seven with 70 uh, data sets and with 10 algorithms in order to be able to use it to avoid this kind of bias. And remember, we like to build things like this one. The next steps is the general artificial intelligence. I put attention about what IBM Research put on the bottom of the of the of the of the slide. They say that this is going to happen in 2050. That means that really we don't know what is going to happen. Because when we talk about general artificial intelligence, maybe we are talking something about very similar to what we saw, in, what we see in the video, okay? We are talking about cross domains, learn some reasons, synthesize, syn synthesize new uh, approach, and broad autonomy. What happened is, when we, s when we see videos like HAL, we think in that the artificial intelligence, what we are able to do, in artificial intelligence, we are talking about the general artificial intelligence. And really, we are not there. As I mentioned before, we are crossing the boundary between narrow artificial intelligence to broad artificial intelligence. The majority of the questions that uh, I don't know you, you experience, but the majority of the, the questions that I receive, they put the questions in the general artificial intelligence. Maybe that could be a very philosophical uh, discussions, okay? But really, we are not there. And we are not there because we need to increase our understanding in different areas. We need to increase our understanding to in, in, in the science and the computational areas. 
we need to accelerate the research to understand the behavior of the brain, to understand the behavior of the, of the intelligence in the people. But also we need to understand and to, and to accelerate the computing models, how we are going to support that kind of advance. Also, we need to advance in the, to, to, to see and to recognize the environment around us. We need to have computational agents continuously and progressively learning using feedback to, in order to behave, taking in account the context where they are moving. But also, we need to advance to in the persistent knowledge based on the reasoning. So, if we are not able to advance in these different areas, we are not going to arrive to the artificial intelligence. And to advance on this, we need time. So, we focus one challenge, and we are going to focus the second challenge. We said that there are three types of, of problems where, with different kind of complexity, what we need to resolve. And in order to resolve the second and the third uh, kind of problems, uh, we need to go to a different kind of computational models. We need to go to quantum computing. To go to quantum computing is not, we are not talking about only to have more power on the hardware. We are talking about to really to have more power and more efficiency in the algorithms. Why do we need quantum computers? Classical computers gave us the internet, smartphones, and even sent humans to the moon. But try asking one to simulate a single molecule like caffeine to understand how it impacts our brains? It's impossible. There's just too much information. Quantum computers may be ideally suited to it. By encoding information into quantum states, quantum computers may make calculations that we only dream of today. So we could one day use a quantum computer to finally understand how caffeine's wake-up magic works. IBM is already making quantum computing more accessible than before with open source developer tools called Qiskit and the IBM Q experience, a free way to experiment. It's accessible from virtually anywhere. Millions of experiments have already been run on every continent even Antarctica. Here's how it works. You enter instructions on a classical computer which travel to a quantum computer hosted on the IBM cloud. The instructions translate into microwave pulses with frequencies and shapes that control qubits and change their quantum states. As the pulses travel over cables to reach the qubits, they go from room temperature to negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes outer space look warm. This movement to the area of such cold temperature only takes about 0.0001 of a second. After the microwave pulses interact with the qubits, any results are returned back along the cables where they are converted into data that classical computers can interpret. Finally, those results are sent back to you. Each of these IBM Q experiments gets us a little closer to realizing quantum computing's awesome potential to solve a new class of science and business problems. Learn about quantum computing or try it yourself. Share this video if you're excited about a future with quantum computing. Okay, do you excited? Yeah, go and share. Okay. Um, okay, so we back to this course. How do the artificial intelligence behave? There are a very few exponential problems in artificial intelligence. The majority of them are nonlinear algebra-related problems. It means that I have an polynomial uh, shape, like could be the matrix uh, inversion. So what we like to do, and this is the experimental area that we are working on, is to thinking about how we can reproduce, for, a, for instance, using the, the problem of classification, how we, how we can reproduce the neural networks' behavior 
that we already know how to do classification in the traditional or the classic computers, okay? How we are able to reproduce that with an quantum circuit. And in order to do, that, to do that, we are going to use one of the characteristics on the entanglement of the, sorry, of the quantum physics, that is the entanglement, okay? These characteristics really is going to help in us in order to resolve this problem. I am not uh, quantum physics at all, okay? So, but it looks like, and if we go to the Heisenberg and Thurston principle, it said that in the quantum mechanic, we cannot know both positions of, sorry, we cannot know at the same time the two characteristics of a particular, that is the position and the speed. If we know the position, we, are, we don't know the speed. And we, we know the speed, we don't know the position. Okay? So, if we have two particulars and we alight and we entangle these particulars and we put the two particulars in two different sides of the, of the universe, okay? We, what we can observe is if we focus in one of the particulars and we decided to measure one of the aspects that could be the position or the speed, what we realize that instantaneously we know the position of the speed of the other particular. When we talk about that, and I suppose that, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that, but the first time that someone told me about that, okay, I really surprised. Because this could happen only for two reasons. First is because the communication across the two points in the universe is faster than the speed like the speed light, but this is unlikely. And the second one, or, the, or maybe the other reason, is because a quantum description of the universe or the world is much more complex than everyday experience we have. So really, what is happening? We, we really, we are in the second, in the second uh, option. Because, but this, all of you, for sure, you have the feel that this is not real. Because we are violate one of the main concepts that we have, that is the localization. And the localization concept tells us, if I am here and I am make I am take some actions over one object, the reaction of the object are going to be immediate and close to me. And what we are seeing with this characteristic is that the same happens even if you have this particulate at the end of the universe. And this is something that we cannot image, but it's real. So, thinking about the two characteristics that we are using for our circuit, in, the, in, the, in, in, our, in our quantum circuit. We are going to use the superposition. That means that we are going to put a particular in superposition. That means they are going to have different kind of the same, but they are going to have one and, two value, one and zero value at the same time, okay? But also we are going to, to use the entanglement characteristics. That means that when one of the particulars when we are able, when we collapse one of the particulars, we are going to measure what is the state in the second particular. So, if we like to mimic, in order to create our quantum circuit, to classify, to classify something, okay, we need, with the current uh, uh, systems, we need to mimic the entanglement. And to do that, we need an, expo uh, we need an exp exponential classic resources. Exponential classic resources is very expensive. Thinking about that if we have, if we decided to, to do the entanglement between two particulars, okay, to represent that 
in a, in a traditional computing, we need 512 bits. But if we like to represent 100 qubits, we need more than the atoms on the planet Earth. This is what it means, it's very expensive. Okay? We are not able, even if we need a circuit, able to represent the, the, the if we need to represent a circuit, we need 100 uh, qubits, and we need to mimic it with the current systems, we are not able to do that. So, thinking about that, every time that we like to represent one state, okay, we are talking about to the number of bits, the, the number of bits that we need to, to use it is to uh, exponential n. Let me explain a little, and this is not easy for me, but let me explain a little how, how the quantum algorithms work, okay? Thinking about the first that we are going to do in a quantum circuit is to put the, the circuit, to put the, the qubit in superposition, superpositioning, okay? That means that if we have two bits, we are going to have four different states. We are going to have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, at the same time, okay? Thinking about that this is a vector, where you have the phase and you have the, the, the amplitude of the vector, okay? So, the first that we are doing is to put the particulars, the qubits, in superpositioning. Now, what we are going to do is to load the data. How we are loading the data? We are loading the, da we are loading the data, changing the phase of the vector. So, we are changing the vectors in the sphere, okay, to represent the different information that we are putting in place in the circuit, okay? And afterwards, with the interference of the different phases, okay, we are going to have the solution, the output. So this is how the algorithms works in quantum. This is what happened in a quantum uh, system. This is IBM Q, okay? Maybe it's not the traditional, it doesn't look like the traditional uh, servers, okay? It looks beautiful, at least has different kind of colors. And as the video said, you have this piece that is in the middle is where the qubits are, the particulars are, okay? And it's the part of the system that is uh, close to the zero absolute. The other one is, uh, is, um, is the, the different um, claves that is, I'm um, sorry, I forgot the name. Well, that introduce or is able to, to, to move the different uh, microwaves, okay? That is the, the microwaves uh, um, make the ch introduce the change in the particulars. Well, Come back to our problem. So currently, with quantum computing, we are able to resolve two kinds of problems. We are able to resolve modeling nature, or we are working in modeling nature quantum level, but also we are working in mathematical problems. And in the mathematical problems, we are, we are focusing in the machine learning. Okay? So, how we are going to exploit the entanglement for artificial intelligence? Um, in the classic, um, if we like to, to do a classification, thinking about if we have different points or different, that could be the, the linear, could represent dif different clusters, okay? We have two clusters. We have the, 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 blue, the, the blue clusters and the dark blue clusters. Okay. 
So, if we like to separate, if we like to, to separate this these two clusters with just one line, it's impossible. Yes? But if we introduce the concept of dimension, different, if we include, introduce different dimensions, Okay? And we position the information in different dimensions, we are able to separate that. Because we, we introduce an hyper, hyper layer that is able, hyper plan that is able to put in one side one. Okay, sorry, because I didn't see that. Okay, so, so if we are able to... Okay, so if we introduce different dimensions, we are able to, to take a look of the... We are able to put in different places... We are able to find a way to separate the different clusters of information. Okay? Okay, so the idea here is how we are going to create our function quantum using that kind of approach, okay? So, here we have the training set. So, we have uh, black dots and we have yellow dots, okay? We like to train in a function that is the, the quantum function, that this quantum function is going to classify these, uh, these dots, okay? To do these classifications, what we are going to do in the function is exactly that. We are going, we are going to represent, the, the function is going to represent the different dimensions, okay, in order to be able to classify the, the dots in the different areas. So, in order to do that, and you can reproduce this, this is in, in, the, in, quantum experience, uh, in the quantum experience uh, tool. Uh, the way to do that is to code, in, to code in the problem using Qiskit. Okay? We can prepare the quantum. That means that we are going to put the, 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 the qubits in superposition. Later on, we are going to establish the using the entanglement between the different, the different qubits. We are going to map the information that to load the system. And later on, we are going to classify, we are going to use an, a quantum classifier algorithm in order to update the quantum network. So now, if we execute this, what we discover is that as much as, as, much as we, introduce, we establish a bigger number of entanglement between the different uh, particulars, as much as occurring is the classification. <coughs> Maybe at this point of time, it doesn't mean that what we are doing, we can say that it's better than what we are doing in the classic computing with the neural networks, but currently, we really discovered something that when we will able to escalate with an enough number of qubits, we can discover the way how to do the classification in a better, with a better uh, results, in a better way, with a better performance. We are in the position of what we call quantum ready. Quantum ready. That means that we have tools in order to to create that kind of circuit, this is what uh, this is quantum experience. And again, the the quantum circuit that you see before, you are able to to accept to the to the, to it from here. Okay. I hope some of you already try to train, to, sorry, try to use the system for your research, or maybe just to to enjoy and to to play with it. I don't know. Maybe you are one of the users of one of the simulations or one of the executions that uh, we already captured during the last four years, okay? At the, at the, end, at the end of this, uh, of this diagram, you are able to see that we have more than four millions of executions of exercise 
of trainings in the, in the quantum currently. In order to work with quantum, the, the, the foundation of the quantum is Kiskit. Currently, but it's not only Kiskit. Kiskit is the, is, well, the, the foundation we are calling Terra. Terra is the representation of the minimal elements that you, know, that you need to, to be able to compute something in the quantum, in quantum computing, okay? It's open source, it's completely able, completely open to anyone, and, what they, are, and they are managing the resources of the, of, the, of the processor. But also we have another friends, jointly with Terra, with Kiskit. We have Aqua. Aqua is the, is the new framework where we have different, uh, a set of algorithms, okay, uh, to helping you to run other algorithms uh, and uh, to run applications on top of Qiskit. And we are going to have an another uh, two elements. One of them is going to be Air, that is the, 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 um, the, the part of the framework that is going to help in with the simulators and also to do the different, uh, to do the debuggings of the system and so on. And we are going to have ICNIS in order to measure the errors, okay, and monitoring the errors of the different, of the circuits. But also we have what we call the, the, the quantum network. And it's the way how you are able to access the resources. Currently, to access to five qubits and 60 qubits is completely open for everyone, okay? Now, if you like to go to 20 qubits, so really you like to do something very serious and with an objective research or to do an experimental, uh, experimental exercise, okay? Or for, for business, you, it's better that you go to the 20. In order to do that, we already uh, established this network because the processors are in the cloud, okay? And to, and to execute your algorithms, you need to go through the cloud. And this is what it is, IBM Q. This is what we have in the cloud. This is in your town, in, in New York, okay? And currently, in these machines, we are running the kind of the exercise that you see before. And that's it, go, because I think it's important that if you are th thinking too classical, maybe you are not going to be in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa. No questions? No question? Uh, no, no, I don't know. It's too late because I... Don't worry for the time. It's your moment. Can I it's because I sat, I moved the cable. <laughs> it's a moment for the question. Any question that you have? Yes, there is one guy. No, he's just walking, just walking. But no question. No question. No question? No? Yes, I have a question. Uh, Victoria has one question. Can you explain whether we are using... We are going, uh, 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 wait one second. We give you the microphone so we can hear you. Can you explain if we are using real quantum computers physically or sometimes people think it's just simulators? Okay, we are using real quantum computing processors. Always? Always, this is your choice. What happened is we have in the Q experience, okay, you have two kinds of resources you, you see in the diagram. You are able to use the real quantums and you are able to use the simulators. What is the people is doing? They are using the simulators in order to approach the first testing of the algorithms, okay? It's easier. And also because there are, what we see is that there are a lot of people that are doing the same kind, they are running the same kind of algorithms. So sometimes you don't need to understand to run your, your algorithm in order to understand the results because someone else are doing that, okay? So this is the reason that we are using the simulators. However, it's very relevant to go to the real quantum processors. Because if really you like to understand how you are going to manage in your algorithms the errors, okay, 
you need to go to the real quantum processors. Okay? And we are running real quantum processors. We have, in the quantum network, currently, we have more, more than 25 institutions working with the 20 qubit servers. Okay? However, I think there are, as you see in the, in the, in the, in the calendar, in the schedule, that we have, we are not in productions. But we are not in production, not only because there are something, we need to, to, to work hard to manage the errors, okay? But also because we need to create this, the application stake, okay? We need to reproduce all the software. This is a completely new way to compute algorithms. So we need to create all the stake. And we are doing with the community. The community is doing that. Okay? So we cannot go to production until to be sure that the community and the institutions are ready to afford to have that kind of resources and to make and to do something and to do something valuable for business uh, with that. Okay? But real quantum processors. It's true that there are a lot of people that are uh, asking the same question. Okay. Any other question? Three, two, one, go. Big applause for Elisa.